um, several people that come back. Hardly after the war was over, you know, it was funny um, when the war ended, uh, they still wouldn't let us out in the camp, all of us, the, the, what I call the special prisoners, the B-29 people. And uh, we weren't all, we had this Navy or Marine kid in with us, and there was a B-24 guy that was in with us, but most of us were all B-29. But the war was over, and they still kept us under guard, because we were still war criminals. And uh, it wasn't until, oh, geez, uh, 10 days or so after the war was over that... Um, I forget who was the in, the, in the main camp, who the leader was, there was a, well, anyway, they went to the camp colonel, a uh, uh, Japanese. He said, hey, let these guys out. Why keep them under guard? The war is over. We're waiting for liberation. The 29s are coming over and dropping food, and we were still under guard. And so finally the uh, camp uh, colonel, uh, uh, commander, uh, let us out, and then we could mingle. And I found a kid from Spokane that was in there. He had been um, in the Philippines, uh, Sergeant Mix. And I, and I saw him back here in Spokane. I went out to his folks' place and we had dinner. And, and I lost track of him and I've tried and tried and tried and I've never been able to find out whatever happened with that family. Even on the internet, I've had people try to find Sergeant Mix, but he's, I haven't been able to do it. But. Uh, then I found the brother of a kid I used to fly with in the training command who was in camp. He, in fact, he was in charge of the mess hall. <laughs> I said, maybe I can be your helper. I'll do things for you. <laughs> but, uh, but we never got to know any of the people out into the, uh, the, uh, into the camp itself. Cause we so weren't... you were still, even in the second camp, isolated? Yeah, we were still, we were isolated all the time. They, they didn't like us. I don't imagine they liked that fellow from Wake Island very well either, all the way. <laughs> they didn't like anybody. <laughs> yeah, he, his experience was was not good. Uh, he he was one of those guys that was that, that was just a happy person. And I actually I interviewed uh, 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 two people. I can't think of the other gentleman's name, but both described the same experience from different ways. And and the other guy was a big Marine that they just beat on and beat on and yeah. beat on. And, and for him, it was the hardest thing that he ever faced in his, in his life. Yeah. And uh, the ship that they took him over on, and out I mean, they would put the bucket down with the food, and then you'd use it for a bathroom. And yeah. I mean. Oh, I don't know how they, the people that came up from the Philippines and those ships, how they ever survived that. I had a friend that was in, uh, that I flew with in Texas before the war, and he was in Wing headquarters there on Saipan. I didn't, and he was shot down. Uh, he was riding. He didn't have a crew, just riding along. And I didn't know it till after the war was over, but we were on the hospital ship. And he was a tall, about six feet four, kind of a big lantern jaw, and the Japanese just just hated him, took a dislike to him, and they just treated him terribly, like they did with this Marine. And um, I found on on the hospital ship, I, don't, I can't remember the day just how I found out that he was there in the room just a short distance from where I was on the hospital ship. I went in to see him. He was in an oxygen tent, and I hadn't really known he had been a prisoner. And he couldn't hardly talk, but he recognized me, and he stuck his hand out. And I said, oh, you know, his wife was named Jean, too. And um, uh, then he died. So, so he, I said, you know, as soon as we get back to San Francisco, I, our genes will meet us, and we're going out and what we're going to eat. and. And just a few uh, couple minutes later, and he just took his last breath. But I couldn't figure out, once they had him, you know, and the good doctors, the nurses, the wonderful care on those hospital ships, but they couldn't save him. But he was just too far gone. They just couldn't do it. I always uh, uh, wondered, you know, you'd think that uh, they could have saved him, but couldn't. So, so yeah. many... Uh, that adds even more to the tragedy to think, you know, he survived. Yeah, he survived and was liberated. And then they couldn't uh, do it. We, uh, I think I was sicker after I got liberated than I went down because we'd overeat. They tried to keep us on a kind of a easy diet, you know, and uh, we were on the hospital ship. I was in a room with eight other guys. I had a bed and a little headset with music playing and 
We didn't know about the atomic bomb at all until I got on the ship, and then we read all about it. And uh, But uh, they would come on to kind of control our eating. But then we had this friend of mine in California, Menlo Park, we'd slip down with the ship's crew, <laughs> and they'd see us coming, they'd get with those tin trays, you know, and they'd load that with food. And I would, I'd be so sick. I would, I, I, I would eat and throw up and eat and <laughs> eat some more. And <laughs> You just that's the thing that maybe you've heard this before with other uh, POWs you've talked to that um, you could eat a great big meal, just stuff, but you're just as hungry. You couldn't really appease that hunger. You you were still hungry, so you go and try to stuff some more, and that's why we were we were sick so much uh, for a while. Uh, you know, then then you level off, but we put on weight pretty fast. It wasn't very good weight. But I was about 90 pounds, and um, we put on about three pounds a day, I think, as I remember, we were eating. We'd get cartons of candy bars and just just stuffing all the time, you know. And what did you weigh before you were captured? About 170. Yeah. So you lost 80 pounds? Yeah. Almost half your weight. Yeah, I was, uh, I was pretty skinny. I, we all were. I, You've seen probably pictures of some of these guys that are just <laughs> yeah, nothing but ribs and bones. So that's the way we looked, and we got out of solitary. Most of us in the early in the war, we all went through those cells in Tokyo, the Kempe Tai uh, prison, and um, we most of us. Then later on, the uh, they got more and more POWs. They were uh, put in these cells, but they maybe they'd have seven or eight people together in one of the cells. So, but we were strictly uh, locked up solitaire, and um, but yeah, they, uh, I didn't realize for a long time just how many POWs that they had. Uh, you know, you'd hear these raids, and sometimes I got feeling, hey, so I hope somebody gets shot down. <laughs> Not that I want them killed, but I, I was so miserable, I want somebody to share my misery <laughs> with me. <laughs> But during the fire raids, um, uh, Kepi Tai had uh, uh, two prisons. That I was in this one in Tokyo, and then they moved me uh, to another in a short distance away. That's where I was taken for execution. And so I was right on the edge of the fire raids. But um, they burned down so much of Tokyo, and those fires were so hot that even though I was um, in a side of building in a cage, no windows at all. You could feel the glow. You could feel the the heat. You could you could smell. You know, it just you can't believe a city burning like that. They lost more in the fire rates than they did in the atomic bomb, and yet it's atomic bomb that everybody wants to get excited about. I've had I've talked to um, groups, and they want me to admit that it was a mistake to drop the atomic bomb, that uh, Japan was licked and uh, didn't have to drop that, and I disagree completely. That, that ended the war, there's no doubt about it, as far as I'm concerned. And if it come into invasion, uh, we would never have been alive very long. In fact, I've got an a order that came from uh, the Japanese high command that uh, sent to commandants of all prison camps, every around the world where they had, or in the Pacific, and uh, the order says, in case of invasion, all POWs will be immediately uh, killed. And uh, but and I, I take this sometime talking to high school kids, and I read the chilling part, and it says uh, spelled out in here. It says, how you get rid of the POWs is up to you. You can poison, you can burn, you can bayonet, you can shoot, you can behead, however you want to kill them, you can, but there must be no trace remaining of that POW. And this was discovered in the files during the, after the war, and, um, and um, I've got a copy of, we have, most of us have a copy of that thing, and it's very, because I've used it in a lot of speeches around, and I tell the high school kids, you know, that, you know, I could have been burned, beheaded, stabbed, poisoned, 
but there can be no trace left of me. And it's a little sobering, and you think that that went out to every commandant of every prison camp. So if it had come to invasion, which I think, what, uh, November 1st, as I remember, that uh, we had the invasion November, set, yeah. something like that, uh, we would have been immediately executed and killed some way or other and uh, disposed of. So we were pretty close. And so don't tell me, <laughs> these people that want to say we didn't have dropped the atomic bomb, we saved my life. And it, was, it, it stopped the war. There's, there's no question about it. I, I don't think anybody can argue that other than that the uh, people are so uh, moral about uh, dropping the bomb, which, you know, it can be argued, but nevertheless it stopped the war. Invasion would have cost countless lives because the Japanese, they were, we'd had women and children. We saw women and kids drilling with sticks and, uh, you know, following commands, young girls, teenagers, and young kids, and this is what our troops would have been facing. They'd come in, um, and you'd take a, a mean old Marine. He's going to think twice about laying down a fire against a good-looking teenage Japanese lady. But as soon as they throw a grenade at you, then you're going to start killing. And uh, we found that in Vietnam and found it in Korea, and it's going to happen. They already had the Purple Hearts cast. Oh, did they? Yeah. You know, it was a bunch, I'll bet. You gave the interesting statistic that a lot of people forget is, is you know, in, in the bombings of Tokyo, the number of people killed versus the number of people killed by the bomb. Um, the bomb really didn't kill that many people. Mm -hmm. It was just a definitive answer oh, yes. to what was there. And, so uh, you didn't hear about the bomb until after... No, we didn't know about it in camp. Um, uh, we had a feeling something was happening uh, a lot of the mean guards uh, disappeared right at the end of the war, and the ones that were left were not too bad, and they were they were we we didn't uh, want to retaliate so much. And of course, I didn't much anyway. Jesus, right when the day of the war ended, I came down to yell at jaundice. Oh, I was a sick <laughs> sick one. I didn't care if the war ended or not at that time for a while, but um, it we didn't know till I got on the hospital ship. And then they were talking about the A-bomb. We didn't know what the heck the A-bomb was at all. But uh, we did know that something big was happening because we lost um, a lot of the guards. We had our number one guard we named Horseface. And everybody thought as soon as the war was over, well, let's get old Horseface and just beat the crap out of him. <laughs> but, but he disappeared. <laughs> and Horseface wasn't, wasn't too bad. He, uh, he laid back my front teeth with a rifle butt one day on my tongue and I pulled him out and they kind of anchored him down a little bit but uh, uh, they didn't stay. I got home and I finally had lost him. But um, it, it's easy to break a rule. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, no, to this day I don't know what I broke a rule <laughs> that he would hit me in the mouth with his rifle butt. But um, well, I never saw horse. Well, one of our guys did see horse face. Uh, they got him, and I think he got five years in the Sugumo prison. And one of our fellows that went back to Japan in '48. He was a career. He was a sergeant, Sergeant Johnson. He's not alive. In fact, he married a Japanese girl. Uh, went back and went to Sugumo and to see horse face. Well, horse face was pretty put out because <laughs> he. He thought he was so good to us all the time, and then, why am I here? Why am I in prison? Well, he, he didn't speak much English, but he did a little bit. He had been a, a gunner on a Grumman or at, uh, in China, and a Grumman had shot him down, so he hated Grumman's <laughs> with a passion. <laughs> uh, toward the end of the war, and my friend Hap from California, that on the honey bucket detail, had, Old horse face would get us out in each end of the garden detail. Watch for grooming. And Hap would get out and he'd take off. And then he'd lay down there in the sunshine, you know, and he would doze. And horse face would So I would get on in the sunshine. The horse face would come over and just beat the hell out of me. <laughs> and so I'd have to stand up there looking for grooming. Old Hap over there, I could have killed him. And I tell him to this day, I'm going to get him for that sometime. <laughs> and, 
Uh, he has gone back to Japan several times and sponsored um, uh, education for some of the people. He met the pilot, the Japanese pilot that shot him down and helped some of the people come back to, uh, to the States here for education. And in fact, he was just back a couple of weeks ago. So he had been quite active in um, um, going back. And, and I don't know if there are other interviews where you found a lot of um, dislike or hatred or of the Japanese by XPOWs. Some of them do. Uh, this little friend Nori from Yokohama, this lady that's helped me, uh, uh, found an Australian that just wouldn't even speak to her because she was Japanese, but he finally came around. But, uh, I never felt that way uh, after war was over. and I was a little mad for a while, but uh, you know, you get over that, and Hap has gone back, and I've gone back about four times back to Japan, and and I like uh, I find the Japanese people. Of course, the people we meet uh, had nothing to do with the war. They, but I find that uh, they're starting to rewrite history a little bit, and it kind of concerns me. And some of the things that um, uh, they're talking about in their history books is not what happened. And I was interested in when this uh, movie Pearl Harbor came out, and I, I thought that was a terrible movie. <laughs> I, 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 I like the um, uh, computer generation attack on Pearl Harbor. That was pretty interesting. But all the rest of that movie, it was such a bunch of nonsense that I never heard. Well, uh, it hit Japan, of course, and I emailed Nori and, and asked her about it. She didn't like it. All her friends didn't like it. But what they were interested in was that Doolittle raid. And I was so surprised, that's all she wanted to know about. She wanted me to get books on the Doolittle raid if I could find them. And what did I know about them? And well, I had a couple of friends on that Doolittle raid and, and uh, we know it pretty well, but, but um, uh, Japan is, is rewriting history a little bit on that Doolittle raid on uh, uh, the, their treatment of the people that they got. They beheaded some and executed some, but they, but they bombed uh, schoolyards and churches and all this sort of thing. Well, they did. They didn't do much damage at all, other than put the fear in the Japanese that that we hit them. But uh, I was surprised at the intense interest that they were showing in the Doolittle raid, where the rest of that Pearl Harbor movie they care less. But uh, uh, Nori, in fact, we were over there in January, and Nori, when she came, brought four Japanese men with her that wanted to interview me about the fire raids and uh, the immorality of those fire raids and why would America, and is America going to apologize? And uh, so Nori was uh, the interpreter, these other, or three Japanese men. One spilled a beer all over his lap while we were having dinner and, and they thought that was uproariously funny. <laughs> and I kept a straight face, but, but they, they were wanting America to apologize for those those uh, fire raids in the car. They're not going to apologize for those fire raids. You're crazy. It, but the inhumanity of it. And I, well, J.C., the inhumanity of all war. <laughs> it knows. Uh, but we're, America is not going to apologize. And I said, when are you going to pay me for my work? And well, <laughs> that's another subject. So they, they got off of that. <laughs> but uh, what did, So they did, when you asked them about from your perspective, when are they going to pay you from your work? They just changed. Nah, the no, they, uh, they, uh, nobody got paid. There wasn't any money. In fact, we did get. Uh, they came in one day and gave us a, a few ten yen notes, which were worthless. And uh, so, uh, I think I have one in my file someplace today. And uh, after war, these things were no good anyway. Well, they weren't any good then. There's nothing by with it. But they said. Oh yeah, we paid you. I think I got about equivalent of twenty cents for five months' work at the gardens. But but anyway, they um, they, they dismiss this sort of talk. But they do think we ought to apologize for the fire raid, not the atomic bomb. These fire raids, of course, that's what these people are over talking about. They left the next day and went to Pearl Harbor, and uh, we've seen a lot of Japanese at Pearl Harbor. You've been through uh, Pearl and. Um, you know, and uh, really the Japanese people we've seen, the tourists are very respectful when they're out at that memorial. But uh, this is just one other little incident. I, I could see where they're starting to rewrite history a little bit. 
And um, now Nori, Nori Nagasawa is her name, and uh, she had, living as close as she did to the prisoners, had no idea of the treatment. In fact, um, I mentioned one day that, that I exercise. I used to get us up once in a while and, and exercise, you know, and uh, Taiso. And so, and so Nori said, now when you exercised, uh, did they have music? And you're in the parade ground and all God, and they had music and you could do all this. And I says, no, I got up in my freezing little cell <laughs> and tried to sh shuffle it a little bit and some Japanese shouting at me all the time. And if I didn't shuffle right, they'd come in with a kendo club. <laughs> and so, uh, well, she didn't understand any of this it didn't, uh, and she was living there. But that's why she has suddenly got interested in the fact I just had an email from Nori, and she's coming to a, some kind of a POW symposium in uh, San Antonio, Texas, later this month. And um, that she went to Australia to see that Australian that hated the Japanese so much, and he came back and visited her in Japan then. And uh, you know, so uh, some of those people are have suddenly got interested, and in just why I don't know. It took them a long, long time. See, they. My understanding is is that also in Japan. They don't teach World War Two. That's true. They uh, they just uh, the history books are uh, uh, not complete on this at all. And I, the one reason I enjoyed going back and um, and talking with uh, with some of the people, they um, went to the Edo Tokyo Edo Museum, and uh, the when I went back, I they got from me well. Uh, they got all my recipes <laughs> and a little diary that I had hidden all the time and my crew picture. And the only thing I got back from Japan were my boots or the, uh, the shoes, not low cuts, but those shoes. And they wanted those. And, they, um, well, <laughs> and I'd made little cigarette uh, holders out of bamboo when we were out at the prison camp. Because we get a little butt, you know, sometimes you get a butt about that big, you put it in a cigarette holder. Yeah, so uh, you've heard all those stories, I suppose. <laughs> but, but anyway, they wanted all those. I'd found a little a mirror outside one day, a little crack piece about like that. And so I had that. And, uh, and I found a, a little magnifying glass, like in a small flashlight. Well, a lot of times we'd find a butt that uh, could light a cigarette. We didn't have any matches. If the sun was shining, we'd use that little, well, I've got that. Well, they took all that. And I sent it over, um, packaged it up, and uh, Gene and I went into this Edo Tokyo Museum, which is a huge museum, a couple of city blocks, you know, and four or five stories high, beautiful museum. And one corner of World War II, we walk in there and there's my crew picture. <laughs> and a case with a light with my boots <laughs> in there shining and next to it is my crew picture and all these little uh, uh, memorabilia that I had plus all my recipes and everything all there in the glass case. I just couldn't believe it. But what was interesting, right next to it, to the World War II, they had a lot of pictures of the firebomb, uh, dead bodies. Uh, stacks of Japanese bodies in the streets, you know, and charred and a building charred. And I wondered about uh, Japanese people, which are quite a few of them in there, would see that, walk on down and see my crew picture, if they'd say, you know, good, I hope you died. I, but I didn't see any of that at all. They, they just were interested. Uh, I wondered, I stood beside that crew picture and I wondered if some of the little Japanese students in there would say, hey, hey, <laughs> but none did. <laughs> so, no, they didn't recognize me, but they kept that display in there for two years. Then they finally packaged it all up and sent it home to me. So I've got it back, my shoes, my magnifying, all my recipes, <laughs> the little cigarette holders. And, so, uh, but uh, I was, to walk into a museum like that and to see this cold, that display, it, it was a shocker. It brings up, and this is a thing that, that we worked a little bit too, is the juxtaposition, the different views of 
In fact, last week we interviewed a, a gentleman, Dr. Weiner, who was uh, uh, in the Hitler Youth and, and uh, at the end of the war fought with the Germans and, and had to be denazified and everything like that. But his perspective, a couple of interesting things. One, he talked about, we talked about the Treaty of Versailles. He talked about the Dictate of Versailles. Um, but he also gave his perspective of what he was doing, how Hitler came and promised jobs and, and they were, you know, the economy was bad and all that. And he said, I went to fight for my country. Now, he doesn't like Hitler. I mean, and he didn't yeah. like Hitler as it went along. What, what um, so you got to see the perspective of here's your view of the war and here's the Japanese view, here's the pictures. Do you think there's a message that World War II weaves for generations to come that you and I'll never meet? I mean, is there something that the history books is leaving out that, that we need for future generations to know? Oh, I, I suppose so. It'd be hard to um, uh, pinpoint anything because uh, so many stories that, like we're talking here, are going to be lost as soon as we're dead. Uh, in World War II, people are going a pretty fast clip. I think 1,500 a day or 1,000, whatever it is, you know, a bunch. One day, we're not going to be around to tell these stories, and that's one reason that uh, we go around talking to the kids about it. But uh, a history book can only give the surface of uh, uh, actions that went on. They can talk about the Battle of the Bulge, but uh, certainly to a guy that was in the Battle of the Bulge and the stories he got of freezing and the snow and the blizzards and the, or the Marines coming out of Chosun Reservoir in Korea, one of the worst retreats we've ever had and people uh, dying of um, uh, freezing and the frostbite and the, uh, you know, it was, it was a terrible incident, but you can read, but how can you, how can you tell the, uh, what it's like really? You can't. In fact, I, it's hard for me to, um, uh, talking to anybody and say what it's like to be so hungry, because I'm not hungry, <laughs> so I can't, I know I was starving to death, and how can you explain it? And or so cold. I was so cold that winter, that winter, that summer flying suit, and bare feet in the cell. And the cell was not heated, and it was very bitter cold winter. And the snow uh, all over the place outside. And the snow we had a broken wind at the end of the corridor, and the snow was blowing, uh, wind blowing right. The snow would come in and blow down. And uh, and one time the and, uh, my hands had all been um, had burned, and they got. Uh, pretty badly infected. And um, they came in one day with a, a bucket of water with an old dirty rag and, and said, wash my floor on my cell. Well, you had to break the skim of ice on the bucket that was cold. And I wasn't about to take that dirty rag with my burned hands. So I made a big show of I get out. Oh, I was washing all over. I didn't have any water on the rag. <laughs> I didn't touch a rag, and, and pretty soon I I spilled a little water here by the where the door to my cell was. Where it was, you got in about that big, and right beside of another little hole where they put the food bucket, and there were seven wooden bars in front, and so I made a big show of cleaning that cell, and I put the thing out again. But I never touched that water, and I was cold, and I, but. Um, um, they did show uh, in my interrogations when I, my hands were, were just so bad that they, uh, they got a doctor, which surprised me because uh, a lot of people, just, they just let them die, but they, uh, they got me out in my little cell and they had a doctor and a nurse. And this doctor uh, it could just speak a little English, not very much, but he was, he was very gentle. They'd take all this bad skin off of the tweezers, and he was, he was very gentle. And this nurse, she mean, gosh, she hated me, and she was jabbing that thing, and she really hurt. And the doctor called her down and really gave her what for, and so she was a little more gentle. But boy, she'd look at me, and if you ever saw a hatred in anybody's eyes, she had it. Maybe she'd lost her family, I don't know, but I, but this doctor was good, but he tried to talk to me about Japanese giving of life. And I don't know what it was all about. I'd give 
anything if I knew, but the, this was Japanese, the, the giving of life, and he was so gentle. Then they um, put a lot of disinfectant all over my hands, and they wrapped them up with bandages, and by golly, they got well. And um, I took the um, bandages off after I cut strips, or made strips, and tied the sleeves of my flying suit around my legs so I keep the cold out. <laughs> so, but uh, my hands were kind of fiery red for about uh, two years, and they finally, yeah, but, but he was a, uh, I hope he survived the war. He was a very gentle man. But what I wish for that nurse, <laughs> I would not wish on anybody. <laughs> she would need. So there are the two extremes. There's the humanity, and then there, it sounds like, is some inhumanity for whatever the reason. Yeah. Some of the guards mm -hmm. that, like you said, you didn't know what the rules were, but you knew you broke some rule that the yeah, guards Yeah, you get clubbed. Uh -huh. yeah, well, you know, the guards we had, I would not say they were road scholars. You know, they, uh, most of them were young kids, and I, uh, and they, well, I don't know. I, I would not class them as a very high intellect at all. And some of them would just ignore you, and some would uh, aggravate you greatly, especially when you're down in the cells in Tokyo in the Kempi Tai. Uh, I, I had a guard uh, uh, ask me if I wanted to, we had a rice ball if I wanted it. In no English, but he, of course I wanted it. He motioned, put my hand out of this little hole. So I did, and he smashed my fingers with his rifle butt, knocked off about four fingernails. And so, uh, you know, for no reason at all, uh, they used to, uh, at nighttime, you'd get in your blankets and have your head toward the bars, and they had a long bamboo pole in this one prison. They'd stick through the bars all night and keep jabbing you in the face and jabbing you, keep you awake all night long with that uh, bamboo. Uh, oh, they used to put their cigarettes out on my face if they were smoking interrogation. and. Uh, uh, things like um, uh, take you out of your cell for go in the interrogation room. Uh, the doors are lower. I was six one, blindfolded, and they put a bay bayonet in your back, and you have to run a pretty good clip toward that open door, and you know it's there. <laughs> and you you try to duck, but you generally cut it above the eyes and knock you flat. Things like that. That um, but some of the guards would not pay attention to it at all. We had one English speaking guard that was very kind, very gentle, but he didn't pay much attention to us, And uh, but he never did anything bad. We had oh, names for all of them, and um, of course, Horseface was a, we had a little, um, we called him Baby Dumpling, and I found out some prisoners had gone there ahead of me, <laughs> they called him Cupid Doll, <laughs> the same guy, <laughs> we called him Baby Dumpling, and he used to take us out the gardens, and he would have his gun, you know, and and he would pop his gun up against a tree or have one of us hold it while he sat down with a little book. And he goes, Jesus, little tiny guy. But if an officer came out from the camp, I, he'd get up and he'd grab his gun and he would slap our faces, you know, just raising hell at us. Then after the officer left, I'd go, I didn't want to do that and sit down and give us his gun, you know. Well, uh, we had a lot of fun with them. Um, incidents like this. It gave us a lot of amusement, a lot of humor, and we never had any feeling against Cupid doll at all, but um, horse face, we, um, we, do, we, we didn't like horse face very well. <laughs> well, I can see you got five years. It's interesting because you, you start talking names, and that's one thing um, the history books often don't put to any of this. I, there's a gentleman over in Bainbridge Island, a Japanese family that was interned and he said that the reason he started going and talking to schools because he wanted to put names with these pictures because it just said Japanese girl gets on boat, Japanese uh -huh. man does this. When you think of names from World War II, do you remember crew members' names and people that stick out in your mind, or does it all just go away? Well, no, I I remember good friends from my crew members and people I flew with way back before the war. You know, I, uh, but uh, they get lost. I. I had a good friend that was killed in the Flying Tigers in Grant Pass, Oregon, and they're having their name in the street for him down there and having a big ceremony for Johnny Hampshire. And so they rode up and wanted all the information I had. And he was a good friend in the cadets, and but uh, we never saw much other 
after we graduated, he went into fighters. I went into instructing and advanced flying school, but he was killed. But, um, you know, some of these close friends, um, even though I haven't seen them in 60 years, stick in my mind very closely. Others, you know, they, the names come and go once in a while. They think, oh, I remember old so-and-so, but next day I can't remember who it was I was thinking of. And, uh, but uh, I, close wartime friends. Now, it's funny, I, I, when I went back to Korea, or I, I was flying B-29s out of Okinawa, I was in a second Air Force wing, headquarters of Barksdale, and I had always been here in uh, Spokane or in SAC headquarters or 15th Air Force. Well, and the short, uh, when I was over flying missions then, I don't remember hardly any of those people that I flew with, but all these, um, Others, I can go back so many years, I do. I, I don't know why I never made any real close friends uh, while in, during the Korean War, but I was in a different wing. There, I was never in that part of the country. Barksdale Field is a long ways away from Fairchild, and I stationed it. Well, I, it, um, it, uh, <clears throat> it's hard to sometimes recall a name with a face. And, uh, and of course, I'm 84. I'm having a hard time recalling a lot of things <laughs> that I used to. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, things are not so easy anymore. Did, did you find that you, I've heard some people say that they kept the separation because you never knew what might happen to whoever's next to you and things like that. So there was this wall that a lot of people put up. Did you feel that? No, I never, never did. I, uh, even we got over in, or both times in Korea and World War II, uh, I, no, I made good friends and I, I never tried to put up any kind of a separation knowing I don't want to get too close to this fellow because he might be dead tomorrow. Never, never felt that at all. I just, um, you know, it can happen I and mean, we, I uh, knew people were going to get hurt, but I uh, never thought it would be me, for one. But I never had that kind of a feeling at all. We had two different pilots told two different stories. One pilot said he got to the point, the first time, one of his first missions, some of his crew members got killed, and he got back, and that was real hard for him. He said after that, when he landed, he never, he, he'd get out of the plane right away and never looked back. He didn't mm. want to know. And then the other one said, I think it might have been Gil, said, um, said, you know, the, the first time that we came out and, and my buddy's plane didn't come back. He says, I went out and cried. He says, after that, I just, I couldn't mm. cry after mm. that. It was... No, I don't, I never, never felt that. I, when I had a good friend in B-29 training, a kid named uh, Irwin, and <clears throat> we got to Saipan, had him, we'd, we'd already made one mission when uh, he came in with his crew. And, um, uh, they had to, he was in the same uh, Quonset hut that we were his crew and, and mine. Oh. And they, um, the foot lockers were all in the But he got there just in time for the second Tokyo run. And I'd led the first mission. The second mission, I was leading the third element on the leader, like uh, three planes, three planes, three planes stacked like that. And I was uh, leading this um, uh, left element. And uh, he was on my wing. So we flew all the way up. Uh, you go in real loose formation until you get up close to Japan, then you tighten in and go to altitude. And he was on my wing, and um, we did a bombing run. Then coming back, we generally split up and everybody goes back separately so you don't have a crowded traffic pattern when you get back to Saipan because you're always low on gas and you don't want to have to go around because of a crowded somebody ahead of you. But, but uh, he pulled off, to, or I pulled off to one side, and I pulled in on his wing just to fly formation for a while. And uh, so I flew on his wing for about two hours, and then gradually I started pulling away, and I was on his right wing. Iwo Jima was off on here where they had Japanese fighters, but we had a dog leg around Iwo, and I was on inside of him anyway. And we gradually, and then for a long time, another two hours or so, I could see the glint of his wings, you know, and the sun would hit him. And finally, we got too far apart, and he never showed up. He never, no trace, no radio call, nothing. He just disappeared from the face of the earth. 
we wondered if uh, Japanese fighters had come out, but I was on the inside. And uh, but anyway, I, I felt when I went into that hut that night and saw their foot lockers not even unpacked, and there he, a good friend, and now he's obviously lost. And I, I think seeing the empty barracks there with the foot lockers is what got to me. But I would not have felt I would not felt like uh, that fellow that didn't want to have any association. No, I, I felt a great loss, but uh, not that I wouldn't uh, keep it, uh, the friendship, or try to not make a friendship. That wouldn't occur to me. But I, I did. That, that kind of grabbed me when I, uh, I think of all things, watching, seeing the, the footlockers there, not even unpacked yet. And there he was, the whole crew was lost. And I, to this day, we don't know what happened to him. When I get up the sky, I'm going to ask that <laughs> to find out. <laughs> hey, Earl, what what happened to you? <laughs> they they and that's the picture again that we hear. That's where people would know a lot of times. Just you come back to the barracks and you'd see which bunks were empty and yeah, you know, that was well. Generally, uh, people come back and divide up your effects, but <laughs> that happened a lot. I I had gotten a dice game the night before I was shot down to one about five hundred dollars. And I uh, was lucky enough the next mission next day kept me out of a poker game. I would have lost five hundred dollars, but, but uh, that money all came home. My wife got it, and she got about everything. My boxes of cigars didn't make it, but then <laughs> that was all right. <laughs> we ate good, but uh, it, it did happen a lot. Uh, people would somebody crew not make it. Well, you you take a place where, you, like Ploiesti, where they lost sixty some B twenty fours over the target. You know, you go home, um, uh, what do you, you got a barracks filled with stuff, you know. Uh, and so people grab this and that, articles of clothing, uh, other artifacts they might have of uh, home or whatever. It just, it happened. In England, I hear it was the blankets. You wanted the blankets. Oh, that's right. And, and that's, you'd get, you know, that one guy told about coming back and they thought he'd been shot down and was gone. And he got back in his blankets. He was going to have a little upset with it. Well, that could be important. I, that second prison I went to um, in uh, the Kempitai, when I was under the Kempitai, it was the same little bare cell like I'd just gotten out of. Uh, it's a prison where I went out for my firing squad. but. In the corner of that prison, they had a stack of blankets, so about 18 blankets, all folded up nicely. Well, we were allowed four blankets, and oh, it was cold. And so when I looked at those blankets, and so when no one was looking, I went over and I took about five of those blankets, and I got all wrapped up. And then I started to feel, for the first time since I'd been shot down, I started to feel a little, little warmth, you know. Well, and a guard got suspicious. So they came on in and they counted the blankets I had. <laughs> of course, I had a bunch. <laughs> so they, they gave me a good beating. And uh, I had to put all the blankets back in the corner. And as soon as their back was turned, and I, I went and got the blankets again. <laughs> and so this went on. Now, why in the world wouldn't they take the damn blankets and get them out of there? But they wouldn't. They just left them there. And every time I could, I'd take some. They'd come in and knock me around put them back, take them again. But uh, I never could understand that uh, Japanese mentality. <laughs> and I had a, a one time out uh, when we were working in the garden, there was a, a young teenage girl a couple of times. Had, she wore a yellow sweater and uh, she walked on the side trees. The, the whole area was burned down. There were very few buildings standing just rubble and our job was to clean out the rubble get down to bare ground where we could dig up and plant uh, gardens but this girl she she had such a uh, kind of a shy smile not one uh, not flirtatious but sort of a smile uh, sympathy I, I know you're a long ways from home what you're going through and uh, we remembered that and one day Horseface saw her, kind of it went over and slapped her around a while, so she never came back. But I mentioned this 
to my friend Nori from Yokohama. She went back and uh, announced it in her church. So they, and they got the newspaper. So they tried to find the girl in the yellow sweater. And they made quite a search around there. And when my wife and I went back there in Japan four years ago, uh, we met the minister and the church where they first started <laughs> the congregation looking for the girl in the yellow sweater. <laughs> but they never, never found her. And so uh, whether she, it was a, my imagination, or oh, the other fellows remembered her too, but uh, uh, she, well, of course, who knows, 50 years later, what could have happened to her, but I always remembered her because she, uh, she radiated a little sympathy, understanding, and uh, of course she got her face slapped for it, but uh, <laughs> there's horse face. <laughs> when you need him, he was there. <laughs> Uh, did you you talked about um, here's your poor bride at home who's, who thought you'd passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, you come back. Did you have to not reinvent but but rediscover each other or or uh, does that does that just the the thankfulness that you're alive uh, overrides mm -hmm. everything? Well, it uh, yeah I I. Um, I got to a, send her a wire from the ship through the Red Cross, and it was kind of an odd incident that happened. I, I went down to Guam, and I was in the hospital in Guam for a while, then back through uh, Letterman General in San Francisco, and I was in the hospital down there at Letterman General. And while we are there, they let every POW have a free phone call home. So, uh, and I wasn't sure just where Jean was, and but I I figured she might be with her sister, and that's the only number I had in Seattle. So I put it off because I didn't want any bad news. Uh, my brother was flying B-25s in the Pacific. He had been shot down, but uh, got back the same day he was shot down. So, uh, but I didn't know that. I didn't know if my parents were alive. I didn't know where they were. I didn't know anything. And I didn't. I was afraid of bad news. I don't. My Gene might have gotten married again. You know, it happened to one of our guys. He got home and his wife had married his uncle, <laughs> of all things. And one uh, one guy got home and his wife died just two days before the war was over. So these things happen. So, but I didn't want any bad news. So I was finally dialing the phone and it was starting to ring. And this friend Hap, <laughs> my banjo hauling buddy. <laughs> Rap on the door and he says, I found an ice cream parlor down here. They make the best milkshakes and marshmallow sundaes here. I hung up just like that. And away we go. And uh, so we had a few milkshakes. But uh, it was a feeling I, I couldn't bring myself to call. Well, of course, I did call and, uh, and got Gene and everything was fine. My brother was... Uh, he was in Japan on occupation duty at the time. My folks were fine. She was fine. She wasn't married. She had gotten a job. <laughs> She'd quit. So uh, then I was put in Baxter General Hospital here in Spokane. That's where the vet's hospital is now out here. And so I was in there for about three months. And um, she came on up and we got a little apartment. They'd let me out on weekends and uh, everything went back real fast. Just, yeah, real normal. I, I never had any, uh, didn't fight the war at nights much. And uh, my main trouble, I had a one-year-old boy when I left, and now he was two, uh, over two, and he didn't like me at all. <laughs> so he was a handful, and I couldn't, I didn't know, I, I he, he didn't know me, you know. And, uh, and uh, so it took a while to <laughs> get the family adjusted there. Yeah, but uh, he wanted no part of me. He didn't know what a father was, <laughs> so. You say he lost the whole year of your life? Yeah, or not, not. yeah when he was growing, uh, getting um, aware of things, you know, and so I had a year out of his life where, but it, you know, this this happens how, my, how many thousands of people came home and, and had to get acquainted with their families. But, when I uh, got back on active duty, I went down to a station at Tucson, Davis Monthan Field in there at Tucson. And my brother came back and he was stationed at Tucson, so we rented a house together and he had a boy just a year older than mine. Of course, he'd been overseas for uh, quite a while too. 
And so uh, he was going through somewhat the same charge, but these two kids together, uh, they got us thrown out of one house. Uh, by turning the hose on the furniture inside and to clean them. <laughs> and they filled my tank up with small, with fine Arizona uh, sand, <laughs> my gas tank. They thought that was doing me a favor. So little things like that, you know. <laughs> so, yes. But uh, the families, no, it didn't didn't take us long. She and I had known each other since grade or high school days, and so uh, we we got back into family unit pretty fast. Did your when your son grew up, did did he ask about any of your World War II experience? Or? Oh, not too much. Um, I, not when he was small. He he didn't wasn't too interested as he got older. Uh, then he he uh, volunteered for the army in um, about '62. In fact, he flunked out of school in college, and he was kind of humiliated, so I immediately joined the army. And he went to Germany, and uh, he was in mechanized. He was in tanks, and when he came back, uh, three years in Germany, he went back to school, got good grades, uh, never had any problem at all. And then since we'd had military life to share, he was much more interested. And now I've got a grandson in a pilot training at Shepherd Field, Texas, and he wants to be a fighter pilot. And he is very interested. He was always writing, hey, Grandpa, we were doing formation work now. Now, when you did formation now, what was your positions and how did you, you know? And so he's very interested, but he's a fighter pilot mentality. He knows it all. He tolerates his commander because uh, he's a colonel, and so he will tolerate him, but he didn't know very much. <laughs> so did Joe. <laughs> This guy has probably got about 500 hours combat time in Vietnam. <laughs> you better listen to him. <laughs> so, well, he knows that, but uh, I have a good relationship with him because of the military. My other grandson is a first lieutenant at um, Fort Lewis in the Army. So uh, they, because of that, are much more interested in my past military experience. And when they got their commissions at Washington State at Wazoo, uh, I got to swear them in separately, and uh, they asked me to do that, and I was I was privileged to go down and, and swear them in. And my uh, grandson Joe, the one's in fighter pilot training, you know, I'm in, in a suit, coat and tie, and after I swore him in, he says, "Grandpa, I'm going to salute you," and I damn near cried. And he stood back and he gave me a snappy salute, which isn't really done. <laughs> Somebody in civilian clothes, but. I just about cried, but anyway, uh, we have a good relationship, but my son, my daughter, she wasn't born until I came home, and um, she wasn't much interested in the uh, past at all as far as military. She knew I'd been a, a pilot and a prisoner and all that, but it didn't mean much to her. When you get together with uh, veterans, prisoners of war, groups, what do you guys talk about? Well, we we uh, we talk some of um, now when I get with my friend that I was with, we discuss the old days. Uh, I go to a POW meeting here in Spokane. We don't discuss the old days. We got German POW, Japanese POWs, and and I didn't know them before. We all got into the association together, so we don't talk about war stories very much, and. Um, uh, friends that I was in the service with, we see occasionally. Uh, not war stories, we don't talk much. But uh, my friend in California, we talk about the honey bucket days quite often. <laughs> and, and, and going back to Japan and, and what he's done with the Japanese, we, we discuss that quite a bit. But um, I think you get past the war story stage, and uh, especially if you didn't know the people during the war or the camps they were in. And I've got a good friend that, um, he was a German POW. Uh, he was flying B-24s and he farms. Uh, well, you might know the town of St. John. And so uh, you probably know that. So he farmed St. John. But, and we used to compare a lot of times and, uh, and talk about 
his camp, my camp, but um, he was a crop duster, and uh, so we talked about flying a lot. But uh, but now you know everybody's heard all the war stories, I guess. So you don't go over. I was just with a Pearl Harbor survivor last week, and he said when they get together, they talk about everything but the war. Uh huh. You know, it's you want to move forward and yeah. enjoy life. You yeah, know, you you go on to other things, but um, uh, I don't suppose he ever forgets it. And he said, that's the other thing that you said. It's like after we talked to him, he said, well, you know, I'll go home tonight and I'll have some, uh -huh. some nightmares of it. Yeah, I don't think you're doing Just like talking with you here, um, you're a good interviewer <laughs> because it brings up things that I hadn't thought of in a long, long time. Because you uh, uh, mentioned something that recalled something. And, but um, I probably... I've said some stories to you that I haven't thought of in years. It's and to me it's so important. See, I wasn't a good historian because all they taught me were names and dates, which they go in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. But if you start talking about people and and events and th now all of a sudden, it's it's personal to me. I understand it more, mm -hmm. and so I can understand the bigger picture by understanding the smaller picture. What was the individual doing? I mean, to hear. So many vets, what were you doing? We were just doing our job. Mm -hmm. But then to hear what their job was and to think, could I face that? Or, you know, what, what you know. The, the, when this project started, one of the arguments the schools had is they said, well, we, we aren't behind this because the veterans just want to glorify war. Mm. I've interviewed, I think you'll be Kate number 198 or 99. I have not heard one veteran tell me that war was beautiful or glorious <laughs> no, or I anything guess not. like that. Uh -huh. But I do hear it was a job we had to do, and there's a time that you have to stand sure. for what you believe in. Mm -hmm. But they also say, I was doing for my country what that person was doing for their country. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's why it's, it's, uh, it's good to, to, to hear. Um, you want to get that stiff? Uh, it's good to hear... Uh, that you don't hold animosity mm -hmm. towards. And, and this is one question I ask people is, when you went to war, were you going against a person, a government, a dictator? Uh, who did you think you were fighting against? Yeah, well, that, uh, I, I think it, now I wanted to fight against the Japanese for some reason, uh, more than I did the Germans. As much as I hated Hitler, much more probably than I did uh, Hirohito or, uh, or the, anybody in Japan, but I, I felt more of a hatred toward Japan. If I'm going to fight, I want to, I want to fight Japan. Besides, I thought I was out in the Pacific, and I go out to some nice little Pacific island, and, you know, dancing girls, and well, sure, sure, I saw a lot of, <laughs> a lot of them, all right. But uh, no, in fact, when Gene and I went back to Japan there four years ago, um, we met through our friend Nori the widow of the guy that first shot me down, that set me on fire. Now, he was a Japanese fighter pilot, quite well known. Uh, and after the war, he survived the war, and he came back to the U.S. in the 50s and got jet training down at Loop Field in Arizona to go back and teach jet flying to the Japanese Defense Force and was killed in a crash. Well, I, uh, I, I met his widow. And uh, I think when the, uh, she had a scrapbook filled with things about him, and Gene had a scrapbook filled with, they were both of us in uniform, me in the Japanese, and here I'm in a class A, USA, you know. And uh, he talks about this ray, or this um, fight that we were in, because we shot him down too. And he talks about that in his diary. And that's how this all came, how, G, how Nori found him, or her. And he talks about, shooting me and how he got shot down, but he, he got to crash land and, and got out all right. But uh, anyway, I thought the touching thing, when we left her, Jean, my wife, went over and they hugged each other. And just think, you know, way back then, there was her husband, a young gung-ho guy out there flying his fighters, and there was Jean's her husband out there gung-ho and that'd be 29. And they were, 
uh, both living opposite sides, but going through the same thing. But they uh, they hugged each other, and I thought it was really a, a touching moment. And um, she couldn't speak any English, but uh, didn't have to really. But I, uh, other than a, a short time, and I couldn't understand the crazy Japanese like on those blankets, you know. And but going out to the firing squad, uh, it just it happened. So I didn't come home bitter on things like that. I used to be a little bitter on, uh, they could have given us a little more food. Of course, they didn't have an awful lot, you know. The, the Japanese, they ate nothing but rice anyway. But you should just give us a little more <laughs> than you're doing. And I, you, you could have done that. And, but you know, the, the beatings, uh, it sounds kind of crazy, but you could stand up there and having a guard whopping you around with that damn kendo club and thinking about that stack of pancakes <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> On my flying suit, I um, um, they had a logo, the Air Force stars and bars, you know, it's just in the suit. And I had a guard that uh, just hated that. He took a great dislike and he'd come into my cell all the time with a kendo club and just beat on that thing. And to my arm, it just paralyzed. I couldn't, I couldn't use it. It was just all swollen up. My shoulder was puffed up and I just, uh, had, uh, every time he was on duty, until he got transferred out, come in and beat, just pound, pound on that. Oh, geez, I, now I could have killed him <laughs> very well. Guard came in one day for no reason, kicked me in the jaw. I was sitting on the floor at my position. He just came in and kicked me in the jaw and kind of got it off center and I couldn't chew and it puffed up like that. And, uh, no reason, but uh, so if I wanted to come home with hatred, or that kind of action would have done it, but uh, it really didn't. It just, um, just, it's what happens. And I happened to be there and somebody else wasn't there, but the fate's a war. So I, I didn't waste any time on hatred. I think uh, I think it might have been Sandy Sanderson that said, you know, because he was one that's kind of the same view that you did. He came back and it was war. It's done. He moved on. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, the one thing though is he said the Japanese didn't treat their soldiers any better than they treated their. Yeah, uh, we saw a lot. They had slapped their soldiers around like they would. A slapping meant nothing to Japanese, and. Uh, uh, the kendo clubs <laughs> are another matter, but but slapping, they were always slapping their own people. You know, like they slapped that horse face, slapped that little girl in the yellow sweater. And one fellow came by one day and dropped a cigarette where we were working and walked on, but uh, horse face happened to see it. And he slapped the guy around too. And he was just trying to do a nice thing for us. And we kind of bowed and already got to because I was sitting to him where he could hear us, you know, so he knew we were grateful. But he got slapped around for it. So it, uh, it the, uh, that military regime in Japan, it was a, they were weird. <laughs> I tell you, they, uh, those soldiers, uh, I was interviewed one time by, or not interrogated by two naval officers, and they had graduated from the University of Washington. So uh, we had a pretty good time. <laughs> they, about all they wanted to know is, could you still buy chocolates? <laughs> and I said, oh, jeez, you can get chocolates every place. You know, they had to give it away. <laughs> so many chocolates. <laughs> and uh, they kind of slather a little bit. I, I take it that they really liked chocolates over there at the University of Washington, but they were very supercilious, very snotty, uh, super to me. They asked, well, why don't your Navy come out and fight? And I said, probably because you got nothing left for them to fight. <laughs> well, I thought I was going to get the kendo club, <laughs> but uh, they just kind of laughed a little bit, you know. And uh, that's about all it was. We visited a little bit about the university, and and but that was it. But I wonder how many people had got caught back there that had been in the States and just before the war had gone home to visit family. A lot of them did get put into the army, uh, knowing English very well, they'd have a good place for them. But we didn't, uh, but 
a lot more Japanese can speak some English than Americans can speak Japanese. And I don't know in Germany, I suppose we had a lot of German POWs that could speak German. I took German in high school and college, but no Japanese. But a lot of Japanese could speak a little of English. And um, they knew a lot of our movie stars. And I told um, a group of them once that I was from, had been in Hollywood and I'd been married to Betty Grable for a short time. And they looked at me either like, this guy is number one crazy, <laughs> or hey, he was married to a movie star, so I don't know which one it was. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they told me um, it, my wife had been killed in an automobile accident. They'd heard through the Red Cross that she had been killed. My son was okay. He wasn't killed, but she had been killed. Well, uh, so what do you believe? I, I really didn't believe it. You, you, know, you wonder all the rest of the time till I get that first phone call. That's one reason, because I hadn't up to that call. I Maybe she had been killed. I, I didn't know. So, uh, But they had a lot of stories. They had a story they told us about a Japanese fighter pilot knocking down a B-29 with a rice ball. He was out of ammunition, so he threw up, uh, uh, flew up alongside the 29 and got his rice ball out of his lunchbox and threw it, and it so frightened the pilot that <laughs> and the guy spun in on the 29. And, oh, they, uh, they, that was great. They, <laughs> brave Japanese pilot. But they took me out one time uh, out of my cell, I think to Atsugi Airport, it was across Tokyo someplace, where they had a B-17. And uh, they wanted 